Um, if you've got a, a, a collection of ancient documents there that we Christians like to call a Bible, uh, turn with me to Matthew 25. We're going to go there eventually. We're going to go to Matthew 25 eventually. But let me just pray for us this morning. So Father, again, Lord, we just thank you for this chance to gather. God, thank you for your word, this collection of ancient documents, Lord, that you have, God, by your sovereignty, preserved for thousands of years. God, where nations and people have tried to destroy it. God, you've made sure that in 2024 that, uh, Father, we have an opportunity to obtain it. God, we have an opportunity to read these words for ourselves in our own language. Father, I thank you that you speak to each of us in our own language. And I pray this morning, God, would you speak to each person in this room, God. Father, whatever it is that your Holy Spirit wants to highlight, what you want to say through uh, your word this morning, God, I pray that you would speak to each of us this morning in a language that we understand. And that, Father, when we leave this place today, that, uh, God, we would understand better... God, how is it that you call us to live in this world and this culture that we live in, Lord, a culture that's going left, right, up and down and all over the place, Father. So thank you for your word. Open our ears to hear and our eyes to see. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, well, we're coming to the end. We've been talking about this whole concept of uh, Romans 12. It talks about renewing our mind. It says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are one to two weeks away from finishing that, which I'm happy about because we started in February. This has been the longest one theme that I think uh, we've ever had in the life of the church, and certainly uh, myself, it's been the longest one theme I've ever had my head down in, so I'm looking forward to um, getting my head out of that and into a few other things. But I think it's been really, really important for us to talk about some of these issues because for some of them, it's been well overdue for us as a church to talk about some of this stuff that's going on in culture. And it's also good for us to be aware because sometimes we, we, we're marinating in culture and ideologies and worldviews and thoughts and so on. And if you marinate in something long enough, you just get used to it. You ever hop into a, a really, really hot bath, a warm bath, you jump in. When you first jump in, you're very sensitive to that water and you kind of, ooh, if you're like me, I'm a, I'm a wuss when it comes to uh, hot and cold actually I'm, but, but I jump in a, in a hot bath Jackie loves it like she has coffee in the morning and it's just boiling hot like blisters in your mouth type stuff she's got to add water to mine because I'm a wolf so I can't have it too hot you know but, but when you first jump in that hot water and, and you, you, you really oh you pull yourself out and you're really sensitive or cold water but then after a while you slowly get into it and after a while it kind of bounces out and you don't kind of notice whether it's too hot or too cold it just kind of is what it is and that can happen with culture that could happen with us as believers is that once upon a time, maybe the church was a bit sensitive to the fact that, you know what, what the Word of God teaches us about life and God and people is maybe a little bit different to the, what the world is screaming at us and saying, hey, this is what normality is. But we hang around and you marinate long enough in it, you kind of get used to it. You, you kind of get a little bit numb to it and it just becomes normal. And so I think it's been really good for us to come back to uh, what Paul wrote to the Romans when he made this statement, he said, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. And to be conformed, all you've got to do is just hang around long enough. You don't even have to do anything, just hang in it. But he says, but don't be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's what we've been doing for about these last three, four months, is, is we've just been coming back to the word of God. And, and I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm just pointing you back to this because a lot of us know what we believe. A lot of us don't know why we believe it. And we're living in a culture and a world now that is believing very overtly things that are the opposite to what the church has believed and things we've held to for thousands of years. But the world is being very vocal about that and they can tell you why they believe what they believe. And sometimes to a degree, I think as Christians, our best argument is, well, well God said. Well, where did God say? How, how did God say? Where is it? What? Show me. And, and, and I think it's time that we get back to... If, if you get nothing else out of this series, here's what I want to say to you. Get back to your Bibles. Just get back to your Bible. Just start reading it again. You don't have to understand everything, but start marinating in this. Start letting the Word of God get back into you because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Culture has changed and the world's view of God has changed, but God hasn't changed. And, and, and if we marinate in culture, we will slowly get pulled further and further away from this. And then what we end up doing is we then have a worldview that says, hey, this is okay. And then we come back to the Bible. And instead of trying to find what the truth of God's word says, we come back to this looking for things that agree with that. Because we've made our mind up that, hey, we've been convinced this is right. So we'll go through this word and we'll find 
scriptures and things that will make us go, well, yeah, well, this justifies why that is okay. And this is how we've gotten ourselves, uh, this is how the world has gotten itself into some of the sticky places that it is because love is love and all these sorts of things that is found in the word of God. God is love, therefore, because God is love, then this is allowed and that's allowed and we can do this. And, and, and we've just drifted away and we've just got to get back to the word of God. Amen? So if nothing else, that's what I hope happens for us, that we just get back into the Bible, get back into this collection of ancient documents and let's see what God has to say. So we're getting towards the kind of end of that and we've touched some touchy subjects. We've talked about a definition of marriage. We've talked about same-sex attraction and same-sex sexual relationships. We've talked about uh, gender and identity. And today what I want to do is talk about the issue of equality. Um, Now, again, I'm going to preface by saying I'm not a social scientist. I'm not a sociologist. I am just a pastor of a church who has dug into the Word of God and tried to uh, find a few things in here that will help us when we think about this issue of equality. Because equality seems to be a really, really big thing in society at the moment. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul writes this to a group of believers in Colossae. He says this, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition. Uh, When he talks about human tradition, what most commentators agree, or some at least say, that this means that uh, don't get caught up in the pagan theories that are current in the day. So there were theories and ideas about life in uh, the city of Colossae, that these people were, were born again in this city from other religions and ideas and came across and started following Jesus. But he said, you're still in that city. You're still in that culture. And it's easy for the ideologies and thought processes of that culture to still get inside of you, even though you are now in Christ, even though you're now a believer. And so he's warning them. He's saying, he's saying see to it that nobody takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition. And it also depends on the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. The elemental spiritual forces. Now, we've been talking about this all through as well. That there is a, and if you're not a believer in Jesus, I, uh, that, that's fine, but I'm just saying what us as Christians believe. We believe that there is not just this world that we can see, taste, touch, feel, and smell. We also believe there is another dimension, a spiritual dimension to life. I mean, we believe in God. And God is not here right now. I'm not looking at him in, the, in, in, in his face, but God is present, I believe, through his spirit. There's also this being called the devil, Satan, the enemy. Call him whatever you want. Bottom line is that God loves us and wants to give us a great future and the devil wants to destroy us because we are made in the very image of God. You think about that. Every time the devil looks at you, he he sees a reflection of God. He sees a bit of God. And he rebelled against God and he's rebelling against society and the world and he wants to take us down a path. And we believe that as Christians. And this is what Paul's saying also to the Colossians. There are elemental spiritual forces uh, in this world that are behind the scenes pulling you down a certain path, getting you to to think a certain way and act a certain way and so on until it just becomes normal. But as Christians, our normal is different to the world's normal. And this is what we've been encouraging each other to do throughout this series, renewing our mind with the word of God, not simply marinating in the ways of the world and the way that current culture sees things. So as I said, today I want to throw some thoughts at you regarding the issue of equality. Now, I'm not going to go down the traditional paths of equality. Okay? What I want to do is just add some things to our thinking about the issue of equality. Maybe some things that right now culture is not screaming at us when it comes to the issue of equality. So I want you to hear my heart and I want you to to hear that I am not trying to uh, cover every base when it comes to this issue. I'm just trying to throw some things out I see in the word of God that I don't think we take into consideration when we think about the issues of equality in the world. So it's important that we look at the area of equality through a Christian lens, not just believe everything we hear in the media. We also need to think through what equality actually is from a more biblical-based position. We do that by looking at the Word of God and wrestling with that issue as opposed to judging equality by the same measure that the world's currently throwing at us and using. So when I look at the world today, it seems the only way to create equality is to create inequality for another. So if I try to create equality for you, I've got to lift you up. In order to lift you up, I've got to put you down. Um, In order for your voice to be heard, I've got to give you a louder platform to speak, but I've got to tell you this group over here, you can't talk anymore. It doesn't seem like equality, but that's the way the world pushes equality. Uh, Equality means I'm going to give you a seat at the table, but to give you a seat at the table, I've actually got to take a seat away from these people over here. Now, my common sense tells me that's just not what equality is, but that seems to be the kind of direction that culture is going in when it uh, pursues equality. 
And it's our cultural pursuit of equality that's led to nearly all the issues we've been talking about in the past few weeks and months. Our pursuit for equality has led to a change in the legal definition of marriage. It came from this issue of equality. Our, our search for equality has led to biological men now being able to win women's sporting events and being allowed to walk into women's change rooms. As trans rights have moved forward and been elevated, women's rights have taken a step backwards and been pushed back down. All these years we spent fighting for women's rights, and so we should have. And now another agenda comes on board, and we lift that up, but while we're doing that, we're pushing women's rights back down, and we're sending them backwards. This is, this is the world's pursuit for equality. This is what's happening in the world around us. It helped us get to the place where you have the right to choose your own gender, but you can also choose your own species and become a furry. You can be a furry today. You know what a furry is? It's where you identify as some kind of animal. I was listening to a woman the other day, and she is a furry, and she identifies as a dog. And this radio interview was talking to her, and she was literally saying, my best time of my day is when my, my boyfriend comes home from work and puts a lead on me and takes me for a walk. It's ludicrous. I wanted to burst into tears. I wanted to grab that woman and shake her. I go, is that all you think you're worth? Really? This is the world we live in. This is what our pursuit of equality is opening up for us. And when someone sits on your imaginary tail, they can actually be disciplined as if they hurt any other part of your actual body. And that happened in a school in Melbourne not too long ago. Little kid sat on a chair, it was empty, and the little girl jumped up and screamed. The teacher said, what happened? The girl said, he sat on my tail. The little boy was spoken to about that and disciplined for sitting on an imaginary tail. This is, this is where equality is getting us. This is what's happening with our natural pursuit. Now, is equality a good thing? I agree 100%. It's a good thing and it's a biblical thing. But are we pursuing it the right way in culture? Mm, I don't think we are. And while I don't agree with the way the world is going about pursuing equality, I do understand that if we keep looking at the issue the same way the world currently is, then we better get used to this cycle because it's perhaps the only way to try to achieve it. If we see it the same way the world sees it, I understand why the world is doing what it's doing. It just is the natural way to try to get equality if that's what you think equality is. The truth is the equality that the world seeks will never be found this side of eternity. When people from every tribe, nation and tongue will all be looking in the same direction, we'll all be acknowledging the same supreme authority, and with one voice we'll all be declaring in unity, you are the only one who has the words of eternal life and we all worship you. That's when we will find the ultimate equality. We're not going to find equality this side of heaven, not the kind of equality that the world is espousing. It's never going to happen. And the other truth is this, as we spruik the idea that we can actually achieve equality for all this side of heaven, we're actually feeding the innate dissatisfaction and sense of being overlooked that is felt by so many who are buying into and believing the world's message about equality. You're telling me this is what equality is? Well, I don't have that, so now I feel ripped off. Now I feel ripped off because you're telling me this is what equality looks like. Well, well our, me and my group, we're not getting that. So now we feel ripped off. Now we feel less than. Now we feel isolated. Now we feel... Because you're telling me this is what it is. Well, that's not my experience. So there's something wrong with the way I'm being treated. And it feeds this vicious cycle in humanity where we're never going to be satisfied and we're never going to be happy. So today I want to throw a few ideas out that hopefully will help us think about the issue of equality in a more balanced light. So I want to use a very familiar story to everybody, Matthew 25, the parable of the talents as a reference point. So I'm just going to read it through. Then I just want to throw some thoughts at you. Like I said, I'm not trying to cover all bases here. I just want to add some other thoughts to the issue of equality so that when we're thinking about equality, when we're making decisions about equality, when we're, we're picking and choosing, when we're going through the process of what equality means, when we're having discussions and conversations with people, maybe we can bring something to the table that might create something that I think is a little bit more like the kind of equality that God would like. Knowing that we will never reach perfect equality this side of heaven. It won't happen. It won't happen. Inequality is not the world's biggest problem. Sin is the world's biggest problem. Matthew 25, 14 to 30. Again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and he trusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Everyone say that, according to his ability. According, according to his ability. He gave them stuff according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. And the man who would receive five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work, and he gained five bags more. So also the one with the two bags of gold gained two more. 
But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five and I've gained five more. Master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold came. He said, Master, you gave me two. Uh, I've gained another two. Verse 23, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. I'm guessing that was not what he was hoping for. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10. For whoever has will be given more and they'll have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Throw that worthless servant outside into darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So society's road to equality is actually a road to inequality. And especially for those of us in this room that follow Jesus. And we know that. We need to know that according to God, we are all equal in value. Who would agree with that? When it comes to equality, the most foundational thing we can say is this. I don't care whether you are black, white, red, yellow, rich, poor. I don't care whether you live uh, in a palace or whether you live in a shanty shack in India or a piece of tin beside a wall. I don't care whether you are the most talented of human beings that can, can, can you know, stand in front of 10 billion people or whether you're a quiet, more reserved, shy person. I don't care whether you've got great sporting prowess or whether you, you, you come last in an international marbles tournament. I don't care. You are made in the image of God and every human being on this planet has innate value because we are made in the image of God. Amen? Our value comes primarily from the fingerprints that are on us. We have the very fingerprints of God upon us. We are made in his image and the one whose image we reflect back is what gives us our ultimate value regardless of everything else. So we need to know that. According to God, we are all equal in value. However, however, number one, we're all equal in value, but we do not all have equal abilities. We need to accept that. We're all equal in value, but how many of you know we do not all have equal abilities? Now, I couldn't stand... I know I told you last week that I did. I stood in front of Latrell Mitchell and he ran at me and I palmed him off. But that was a dream. I did clarify and say that was a dream, right? But I reckon I couldn't stand in front of Latrell Mitchell and I couldn't tackle him, right? He would run me over like a steam train, knock me out, and I would wake up in 2029. But Smith, where's Smith? Smith's not here today. How many of you reckon Smith could stand in front of Latrell Mitchell? I'd, I'd back Smith standing in front of Latrell Mitchell. No worries, I'd back them to go toe-to-toe. So Smith could stand in front of Latrell Mitchell because he's got an ability that I don't have. He's got a body that I don't have, a skill set playing that game that I don't have. So there are things that Smith could do that I could not do. And if I did do that, then I wouldn't need Christ who strengthens me. I would need Christ to raise me from the dead. You know, we can't all sing like Dave or Steve. We can't all sing like these guys. We can't all sing like Lorian. We can't all sing like these people. We can't all build homes like Mick Carcass. You know, when people come, whenever we have meetings here, to this day, the number one thing people comment about our building, when they come in this building, they look at that's an amazing building. You know what the number one thing they comment on is the stairs. They comment on the stairs still. They still talk about the stairs. Well, Mick, Mick we were just, I just said when we put this here, let's just go plop, 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 and make stairs. Mick said, no, 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 we can do this, and made this beautiful staircase that's put a rise church building on the map. Every pastor comes in, oh, I love those stairs. <laughs> well, you know, I just drew a plan once and gave it to Mick. No, I didn't. But we can't all do that because we're not all like Mick. I can't give birth like my wife has. It's not going to happen. I don't care what anybody says. I can't do that. We are all made differently. My wife has abilities and, and things that she can do and, and stuff that, that I can't do and I have things that she can do and, and I can do and you can't do and so on. All of us have different abilities in this life. We have different personalities. We have different giftings, different strengths and weaknesses. There are different things that bring us down and different things that pump us up. And more practically, 
There are different things that we're motivated to want to achieve and excel in and other things we're just simply not motivated to want to achieve and excel in in this life. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do what? All things through Christ who gives me strength. It doesn't mean I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I'm not going to tackle the trail Mitchell. I'm not going to build stairs like Mick does. I'm not going to have a voice like these guys. I can't do all things. If we go back and look at the context of that, Paul's talking about this. He says, you know, I, I learned how to live with everything I wanted and, I had all, and then I've learned how to live with nothing materially or nothing that I wanted, the freedoms and liberties. And he says, I've come to this conclusion. I can live that way or this way through Christ who gives me strength. So Christ, is not, Christ doesn't give me strength so that I can do all things in anything regardless of my ability. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is I can, I can survive and prosper, uh, uh, prosper and thrive in any environment because Christ gives me strength to do that. That's what that verse means. We can't just do anything we want. Our, our quest for equality is trying to alleviate this truth by making sure everyone's circumstances are good, by trying to legislate out of society anything that makes anyone feel not good. And that's impossible because we're all so very, very different. We're all so very, very different. So yes, all men were created equal in value, but we've not been created equal in ability. We've not been created equal in ability. Generally speaking, it's actually true. Most white men still can't jump. We can't. I've tried. Number two, moving on. We are all equal in value, but we do not all begin on equal footing. How many of you know that? We're all equal in value, but we didn't all begin this life on equal footing. It says that when the master came, he gave some one, he gave some two, he gave some five. You know, I spent most of my life feeling like, God, when I look around at people around me, they're smarter than me. They're, 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 they're. When I was growing up, we, 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 were not, we were not at the top end of the socioeconomic platform, let me put it that way. We lived in housing commission places. We couldn't afford to pay bills. We, we, and that, that stigma that goes with, with living like that. And, and I always thought, man, if I just had a better start, you know, if, 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 if God had given me five, I could really make a difference with my life. But I only got one. I only got one. And you know what? Right, wrong, indifferent, it is what it was. We all came into this world in different places. We came into this world with different parents. Came into this world and we were brought up with different values. We were all brought into the world in different socioeconomic starts in life. Some of us started, we, our parents had homes when we were born and, and, and new, drove new cars and so on. Some of us had XA Falcons with holes cut in the floor because your dad couldn't get the parts to fix the, 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 the three on the tree and so he cut a hole in the floor and stuck a metal bar through it. And every time we drive downtown, smoke would come up through the metal bar at the bottom. We had dogs, we couldn't have dogs in the house, so we took the back seats out of the car and the dogs lived in the car. And I had three old car batteries in the back seat. And when I'd be driving it along between Evans Head, Woodburn and Ballina, my mates would be hitchhiking, I'd stop, and they would look, look at the car and they would go, no, no, no. And they'd tell me to go and they'd get in somebody else's car. We all started somewhere different. We all had a different start in life. We're all equal in value, but we all started out somewhere different which means that we're all probably on different stages of that journey. You know, no, no, nobody in my... Uh, my parents never owned a home. My parents never owned a home. Me and my wife at 48, 48, we finally got the opportunity to buy a home. So now that we've got a home, we're hoping one day to get into a position where maybe we can help our kids get into a home and then hopefully by the time they have kids that then they're in a better position and, they, and, and hopefully we can see something go on through the generations with our family. But we all started at a different place. We all started at a different place, which means six months down the track, if I start from here and I'm walking that way, but you've started over, you know, two kilometres in front of me and you walk, and we're walking at the same place for the same amount of time, we may end up at different places. It's not inequality. Unless you're looking at equality from a different perspective. We're going to see things differently. We're going to feel things differently because we didn't begin on equal footing in life. The third thing to think about, we're all equal in value, but we do not all get equal outcomes in life. We don't all get equal outcomes. True equality is not about equal outcomes. 
It's primarily about equal opportunities. In the parable, all three servants were given an opportunity to do something for the master. The guy with five went and did something. The guy with two went and did something. What did the guy with one do? He did nothing. Oh, poor guy. I feel sorry for him in the end of the story. I don't want to see anyone thrown where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and so on. But at the same time, I go, dude, you were given an opportunity here. You were given an opportunity. The guy with two was given an opportunity. The guy with five was given an opportunity. The guy with five did something with the opportunity. The guy with two did something with the opportunity. The guy with one did nothing with the opportunity that was given to him. Big, small, indifferent. Doesn't matter. Opportunity is an opportunity. It was an opportunity to go forward. He didn't take the opportunity. Society seems to have a problem with this idea. And so what we do is we give everybody a ribbon. Everyone gets a ribbon. You finish first or last, we're going to make sure that you get the same feeling of being a winner and that everybody, un, until, of course, they go to university. Isn't that funny? And then all of a sudden, they didn't get a good enough mark and the university says, we're not going to take you. And they're like, what? But hang on, since when's it about that? I came last and got a winner's ribbon every time. So we give everybody a ribbon, which ultimately hurts those who have the most ability and it rewards those who just simply don't. Nothing wrong with that. There are some things in life I'm hopeless at. I never went in swimming carnivals at school because honestly, it, people that look at the way I swim, they throw their washing in a bit of washing powder. <laughs> Thrashing about like a washing machine. I was hopeless, hopeless at it. You know? I just can't swim. But I'm not going to drown. We create quotas in business and politics and even sport now so that the most qualified are no longer necessarily the ones who get the jobs. We've got to have four of this and four of that and four of that. But what if... The top 10 were all that. Well, that means 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you guys are going to miss out for people that are less qualified simply because we've got to be equal. Is that really equality? Those other six people that trained hard, that educated themselves, that worked hard to get into a position, they're now told, look, we know you've done everything right in terms of effort, but simply because you're just the wrong person, sorry. And we call that equality. I'm not quite sure that we have equality right. Anyone ever uh, heard of Ronda Rousey? Anyone heard of Ronda Rousey? She was a, 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 yep, a fighter. I, I saw her. She came out to Australia a number of years ago, and it was an awesome interview. She sat down with the Australian journalists, and this is when uh, the netballers and that were talking about um, um, pay, uh, um, uh, women getting paid in sport, right? They were talking about the, the payments, and the women were saying, we, we need to get paid like the men and so on. And she came out, and she at the time was the highest paid MMA fighter. And she's a woman. And, they, and the Australian journalists, they, got, they sat down, they said, man, you must, be really, uh, uh, you must really think this country's backwards because you know when our female athletes get paid, blah, blah, blah. And she actually stopped them right there and she said, here's the deal. She said, I don't get paid the most in my sporting field because I'm a woman. She said, I get paid because I generate more income back into the business than any other fighter. She said, so when your sports people are bringing in that kind of income back into the organisation, well, maybe then they'll get paid more. But you don't get paid more just because of your gender or your this or your that, whatever. She said, please don't be fooled into thinking it's just because I'm a woman. She said, I'm the best in my field. And I bring more money back into that organisation than anybody else does. That's why I get paid top dollar. I thought, wow, good on you. It's true. And it's not being disrespectful or rude. Number four, moving on really quickly. We're all equal in value, but we do not all get the exact same opportunities. The master gave one, one, he gave one, two, and he gave one, five. Why did he give one, 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 two, one, five? Why would he, why did he do that? Well, he tells us. He says he gave to each according to what? Their ability. Doesn't that make sense? Anyone here ever give the keys of their car to their six-year-old and say, go pick your friends up? Anyone ever do that? Hey? Huh? Huh? Anyone ever say to a four-year-old, hey, there's a stove over there, go and boil the water and put an egg in it for me, would you? No? No? Why not? You inequitable people. I'm going to call you on that. That's inequality. Or is it just common sense? Is it, is it, is it your way of protecting people that don't quite have the ability to do that thing? Is, are you doing what's best for that person by just giving them what their ability enables them to do and not exposing them or putting them in harm's way by throwing them in places where they simply don't have the ability? 
He gave to each according to their ability. And you know what? We shouldn't all get the exact same opportunities because we each have different abilities and depending on our abilities, opportunity can either help you or it can hurt you. It can help you or it can hurt you. Well, Paul writes in the New Testament, he talks about when you're releasing leaders and that, and he says, he says don't give uh, leadership to somebody that's just come to faith. How inequitable is Paul? No, no, what he's saying is, if you do that, th- th- then you're probably going to hurt that person because maybe they'll get proud. Maybe you're going to give them responsibility that spiritually they can't carry. There's reasons why he says, hey, no, 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 th- wait. Don't give your life to Jesus today and pastor a church tomorrow. Wait, grow in your faith. Learn to follow Jesus. Learn to love God. Learn to love people. Opportunities can either help you or hurt you. Uh, we've got a family member, actually, and about... Um, how many years back now they won the lottery Had family they won lotto 1.15 million dollars or something which doesn't seem like a lot today but this is 20 odd years ago it was a lot back then and they won the lotto and that's how much money they won within I think it was two years within two years of winning that amount of money they were in debt the same amount that they'd won why? they did not have the ability to manage that kind of money some of us should put our hands in the air and say, praise God, I'm not rich. Okay? Praise God, I'm not rich. Because who knows where I'd end up. You've got to have the ability to manage the opportunity, otherwise the opportunity will hurt you. It'll hinder you, it'll harm you. It won't benefit you. So it's not inequality to not give certain people opportunities. Sometimes it's the most loving thing we can do. Ever thought about the blessings of the opportunities that you never got in life. Uh, Ever heard of the song Unanswered Prayer by Garth Brooks? Any country music fans here? Garth Brooks had a song years ago called Unanswered Prayer. And in the song, the chorus goes, I thank God for unanswered prayers. Now what he would call unanswered prayers, maybe we would say as Christians it was answered, just God said no. Right? But the point is this, he's got this marriage, he's with his wife and another woman comes along and he bumps into her and he remembers that they went to school together and he used to get on his knees every night and pray, God, I'll do anything if you just give me that woman. He never got her, but he got this other woman. And as he's chatting to her, the song goes along. uh, As he's talking to this woman, he goes, wow, I'm so glad that God said no and that I ended up with you. And all the ladies went, oh. I had this girl, same thing, when I first became a Christian. and Well, I hadn't really become a Christian. She went to a youth group and she was really attractive. And so I thought, God, I'll follow you if you give me her. It lasted a week. Well, in the same way that Garth Brooks thanks God for unanswered prayers, we should thank God for some of the opportunities in life we never got. I'm glad I never got the opportunity to join a rock band when I wanted to, just before I came to faith. If I had joined a rock band, who knows where I would be in life right now? What would I have gotten caught up in? Would I have responded to Jesus? I don't don't know. So I'm glad that I didn't get that opportunity. I'm glad that I didn't get a chance to play rugby league for the Tigers. I wanted to. It was one of my goals when I was young was to play league for the Tigers. I'm especially glad now that in hindsight, knowing... And you should all be grateful that I never got the opportunity to run this country. Otherwise, you'd all be going for the Tigers. (laughs) I'd put it in the Constitution somewhere. Apparently, you can make these things happen. Everyone has the opportunity to get a driver's license. But they need to learn how to handle a car before they're given that opportunity in its fullest. And if they never manage to learn how to handle a vehicle, then praise God, they'll never be given a license. Unless they're in Queensland. Um, It's one week. It's only one week. But here's the good news, people. Every one of us, we all do get an opportunity, big or small, in action and attitude to move forward in this life. And that's a quality. Victor Frankl, he wrote a book. He was a, a Jew that was in a, a prisoner of war camp. He wrote a book called um, Man's Search for Meaning. Anyone ever read that? I read it every one to two years. I reread that book. It's an amazing book. He's not a, not a Christian, but he's an amazing man. Survived this concentration camp and the things that he learnt through his experience there. And he said this, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way, And that's something that unless you're willing to lay it down, it cannot be taken from anyone who's prepared to fight for it. So true equality should be about equal opportunities according to our abilities, not equal outcomes according 
regardless of abilities. When I look at the world today, I think that's the biggest thing we've got wrong. We think equality is about equal outcomes. And until everybody is on the same level, we're going to keep saying that we're inequitable and we don't have equality. I don't see that when I read the Word of God. And I don't see that when I look around at the world around me and the people that try hard and the people that have, have, have laid a foundation and passed on to the next generation or the people that have gone out and pushed themselves to achieve things that they want to achieve. And then I look around the world and you see people that don't want to do that. Or if we, don't, if we don't have equal opportunities, then we need to fight for that. I believe in fighting for equal opportunity. But I don't believe in pushing for equal outcomes because it's unachievable. It's unachievable. The opportunity given to you in life is the opportunity for you to produce an outcome. Some of us might not like our outcome. Some of us might want somebody else's outcome. But don't put all your eggs in this earthly basket. We're aliens and strangers here. And all the things that the world tells us we can have down here, it's not true. This is not our home. The Bible doesn't promise us everything down here. It says we can have a great life, a really good life. But if you think you're going to have ultimate equality down here, it's a pipe dream. You think you're just going to have a utopian, dystopian type of peace all over you all the time down here, it's a pipe dream. You think you're not going to have any problems down here, it's a bit of a pipe dream. True equality... It's about equal opportunities, not just about equal outcomes. Opportunity can be handed to us through external factors, but outcomes are based on our own ability to make the most of the opportunities that are handed to us. It's gone very, very quiet in here all of a sudden. Governments and rule makers can legislate opportunity, but they can't legislate outcomes. So equality is an opportunity to produce an outcome, not an outcome itself. This means that you can have equality in a society that has different outcomes. Part of our problem in this country is we're looking at different outcomes and we're screaming that we, we have such inequality. And so on. I'm, not, I'm not saying that we've got equality right. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I don't think we're as bad as what the media's trying to make us out to be. I've lived in India. You think that we don't have opportunity here? Go and live in India. Go to Afghanistan. And go and tell a woman in Afghanistan how hard it is over here that we don't have, proper, we don't have equality, we don't have opportunity. Opportunity is relative. We have an incredible country and incredible opportunities here. I'm not saying we're completely equitable. Don't anyone walk away and say, I think we've nailed it. We haven't. But I don't think we're going to nail it this side of heaven either. But I am getting sick of hearing how hard it is for us here. We've got, we're not called the lucky country for no reason. Lucky for everybody? I'm not speaking on behalf of everybody. I'm just speaking generally. It is possible to have different outcomes and still have equity in a society, in a home. As believers, we should be standing for equal opportunity, but not necessarily equal outcomes. God gives us the best example of equal opportunity. Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What's the outcome? You can be saved, but it's only going to be done for those who call on the name of the Lord. The opportunity is there for salvation for everybody. But God doesn't force that on anybody. He's not trying to make an outcome happen. He says, it's your choice. It's your decision to follow or not to follow. Society is pushing its version of equality without actually acknowledging one important fact. Not every person is going to or is willing to take the opportunities that are given to them. Not everybody's going to take them. The guy with five took his opportunity. The guy with two took his opportunity. The guy with one decided not to take the opportunity. He decided not to take the opportunity. There's a strange verse in 2 Thessalonians 3. I'm about to finish up. Verse 10 to 12. Paul writes this. He says, For even when we were with you, so we gave you this rule, the one who was unwilling, notice he did not say unable. There's a big difference here between unwilling and unable. He says, The one who is, not, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. It's pretty harsh, isn't it? We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They're not busy, they're busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus, settle down and earn the food that you eat. That's a bit harsh, isn't it? If you can work but you choose not to, don't eat. That's harsh. That's harsh. But what's he saying? 
saying you've got an opportunity to produce an outcome and you choose not to. Don't cry about it. Just like the parable of the talents, we play a role in the outcomes we get in life. Take the opportunities that we have. In closing, we're equal in value, but not in ability. Equal in value, but we're not all afforded the same opportunities. We're equal in value, but we don't all achieve the same outcomes. So we live in a time and a generation where we actually believe we can solve the world's issues if we were just more fair. However, we cannot solve the world's problems by legislating out of culture everything that hurts, offends, or disrupts the world of another person. All we're doing if we do that is we're removing resilience, the very thing that we all need if we're going to make significant progress in this world. Life wasn't fair for Moses, it wasn't fair for Noah, it wasn't fair for Abraham or Joseph, for Jesus. It wasn't fair for Peter or Paul or the believers in Acts who had to flee their homes because of persecution. It's not fair today for believers in Afghanistan, Iran, China, India. Life this side of heaven just isn't equitable and fair. We do what we can, but we'll never completely achieve it because the root of the world's problem is sin. It's not equality. And the answer to the world's problem is Jesus, not equality. Stand for equality, fight for equality, but do it knowing that ultimately equality will not answer the deepest questions in the heart of man. Where did I come from? Why am I here and where am I going? That's why certain groups in society today have never had more freedoms, more recognition, and never had more validation than they do now, but it's still not enough because it never will be. At the heart of man, we need Jesus. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, I know, God, that uh, God, I know that I'm sure this brings questions up for people. God, I haven't tried to answer every question this morning, Lord. I'm not trying to answer every question. And God, I'm sure some of the things I've said today will bring up more questions for people. And God, I hope it does. I pray it does. Because God, ultimately, I just want us to think about these issues. I want us to think a little more in line with the world that you created, God. A little more in line with biblical values, a little more in line with the stuff that your word teaches us and not just slowly get dragged away with the narrative of of society and culture today, Lord. That would... God will never be satisfied. This world will never be satisfied. It doesn't matter what we give people. It doesn't matter what laws are passed, what rules change. There's always going to be something in the heart of man that screams out, I want more, I need more. Because ultimately, Father, we need you. We need Jesus. We need to find our value in you. We need to find our purpose in you. And God, I thank you, Father, time and again in your word, you remind us that we are aliens and strangers. We are sojourners. We are exiles. God, we are just passing through this world. And Father, I pray, I pray, Lord, that God, we would keep that perspective. We would keep that perspective, God. We wouldn't look for ultimate happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction in things down here where moth and rust destroy. But God, we'd find it in you. God, we find it knowing that one day we're going to shed this skin, this body of ours. But Lord, when that happens, it's not the end. That's going to be the beginning of something so amazing and so wonderful. That all the sorrow and disappointment and pain, all the stuff that we go through here in life, all the things that don't go our way will seem like nothing compared to the joy that's awaiting us. Father, we thank you, Lord. And God, I pray you'd bless this uh, food, Lord, this afternoon as we have a barbecue together. God, bless the food to our bellies. And bless the hands that put that together for us too, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Awfully quiet. Wow, of all, every week it's just the quietest. That's okay. That's okay. Like, it's all right. Like I said every week, if you have questions or things you're not understanding, do what you've been doing. Come and talk to me personally and let me explain if there's things you didn't understand or whatever. Come and see me. Let's have a chat and a conversation. Uh, more than happy to, to talk to you and so on. All right? Bless you guys.